All right, welcome into another episode of the Bible Bros and Coffee Podcast. My name is Rick McClatchy. I'm your host tonight. Got my ever faithful co-host Matt McLean. What's going on, Matt McLean? How hey, are you, man? How, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing super good. I'm excited. Uh, to jump back into the Word of God, you know, we, we've had the privilege of having some pretty good interviews happening. Um, and so we, you know, took some breaks here and there from, from spending time in the book of Acts, but we're getting to knock out another chapter of it tonight. Uh, and I just love the opportunity to dig into the Word of God, see what it has to say to us, and um, all while sipping on a nice cup of coffee. Um, uh, you know, this, uh, this mug actually is a shout out to all my Portland people, it's a McMenamin's coffee cup that I got from my friend Kyle. So shout out to Kyle, who better be listening to our podcast uh, because I'm kind of his boss at work. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. And anyways, um, that uh, that could be misconstrued. But anyways, so um, yeah. So speaking of coffee, I uh, always like to give a shout out to the Industrial Coffee Company folks. Uh, they are rock stars in our book. They, uh, they help uh, sponsor the show. And uh, they roast coffee fresh and ship it straight to you. If you go to industrialcoffeecompany.com, uh, you can order. You can use uh, promo code Bible Bros uh, to get 10% off your order. They've also got some sweet merch. I usually like to drink out of my Industrial Coffee Company cup, uh, but I like it so much I was using it the other day and it hasn't gotten cleaned yet. So it's it wasn't usable tonight. But anyway, so... Um, tell me, uh, reflecting back on some of our, of our interviews, uh, I'll just, I'll hit you with a surprise yeah. question tonight. Uh, what's, what's something that kind of stuck out to you that like really impacted you about, uh, in any one of the interviews, you know, whichever one you'd sure. want to reference. Yeah, it was, um, Lisa's interview on, you know, having to go through cancer, you know, and hearing that in a real life testimony and how she uh, handled uh, the pain and suffering and the processing of what was going on in her life and basically how she had to, you know, deal with it and all the problems that come with having cancer and still keeping her faith through it all. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I love that um, just the realness that like the raw yeah. authenticity of her story that she didn't like, pretend like mm -hmm. losing her hair didn't bother her like she owned it like no this is super upsetting she she didn't pretend like you know having to have a hysterectomy and officially not ever being able to have kids like no super bothersome super super challenging yeah. to get through and and i just that's what i one of the things i really loved about that story is it just speaks to the authenticity the genuineness that God really wants us to have in our, in our faith, in our relationship with him, like no fake sees, man, like be yeah. a, be real. Like, uh, it's like, you know, we've, we, I know you and I have talked about before Psalm, Psalm 88, man, like Psalm 88 starts out depressed, uh, yeah. in the middle it's depressed. And at the end it's depressed. And, and, uh, you know, he never gets it right. Like, uh, he, he's messed up the whole time, you know, and, uh, and yet you find out later that, He's still serving in the courts of the Lord. And so, you know, like right. he came through it at some point. Right. But yeah. So God left that in the Bible, I think, to help us know, like, hey, you don't have to be a robot. You know, you don't have to you don't have to act like you ain't got no feelings, right. you know, whatever. Um, and then I really. Um, I I really uh, got distracted there for a second. And so now I'm trying to reel it back in um, the another interview that we did was with uh, Max Bravo. And one of the things that really stuck out to me about the interview with him is how many areas where he had like an insecurity or a weakness yeah. or maybe just a straight up area of need in his life. Mm -hmm. And God actually used him to help meet that same need in other people while simultaneously meeting the need in his life. And how God operates sometimes in our lives through, well, I think a lot of times, not just sometimes, but a lot of times through our weakness, through our areas where we we feel really challenged, through the areas of our insecurities and stuff. Yeah. And so I was just really like, 
hearing his story. And I mean, I, I lived a lot of that story too, right. walking alongside him, but um, man, I, I was like freshly, freshly impacted by that as we went through. And so kind of fun to uh, recap a little bit stuff that we've talked about uh, with folks and, um, and, you know, maybe next time we can recap a little from the interview with Joe really appreciated having Joe on the podcast as well. And so now we're going to go ahead and jump into uh, Acts chapter 14 is where we're at. And, um, you know, we in Acts chapter 13, we talked about, um, you know, they did some prayer and fasting and they sent Paul and Barnabas off on some missionary journey. And so that's kind of where we're at right now is they're just going along in their journey. And so we'll kind of pick up right there and uh, we're going to jump in. I uh, It's been a little bit since we recorded that last yeah. episode, so I'm not going to pull I'm not going to pull a fast one and, and <laughs> have you catch me up because uh, that'd be mean. So, um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and share the screen for those that are watching on video. And uh, we're going to jump right into Acts chapter 14, verse one. It says, in Iconium, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord, who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. But the people of the city were divided, some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they found out about it and fled to Lycaonian, to the Lycaonian hmm. towns of Lystra and Derby. That is a tough word. I yeah. love tough words in the Bible. And uh, to the surrounding countryside, and they uh, there they continued preaching the gospel. So, just you know, kicking off with those first seven verses. Anything in there that kind of jumps out at you that you're like, "Whoa!" or you want to comment on? Yeah, that um, even in spite of the reaction of the people, um, you know, getting ready to like, what did say, like, like stone them or something? Would yes to mistreat them and stone them and how they spoke boldly with all that reaction, you know, for the Lord in, in spite of how the people responded. And I think it's easy to let, you know, fear about how other people are going to react, stop us from, from sharing the gospel ourselves, but we're not also not getting the persecution that, that they even experienced in, right. yeah. in real life. Yeah, I, I actually was really honing in on some of that same piece right there. And then just to add on to that, um, I was interested. I really like the fact that they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. And, and I think that this is kind of an important um, dynamic to remember in the church realm is not to say that you can't ask God to heal any darn thing you want, because God is incredible, unbelievable, beyond mm -hmm. anything that we could ever ask, think, or imagine, right? Like, God is that good. Yeah. Um, but but the primary purpose, it seems, from, from biblical example, is that signs and wonders are meant for the 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 forwarding of move, the forward motion of the gospel essentially yeah. to see the gospel message or to confirm the gospel message and so um i think you know perhaps let's say in the last 50 years the american church for example since that's the context you and i both live in the american church has i would say gotten very uh as a general rule kind of non-missional kind of non evangelistic, non, like they've kind of, you know, more attractional church model, more come yep. and see. And so I think that could be one of the reasons why we, we see less and less of kind of the signs and wonders uh, of, you know, demonstrated in our midst. And, and so I thought, man, hmm, you know, interesting, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that we yeah. could consider if we began as a church, big C church, big picture, mm -hmm. you know, began to focus more on going out and, and, you know, planting churches and, and doing the thing, you know, what might God do 
to uh, to confirm and to verify the word. But I also think that it's good to note that um, they they spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. So even before mm-hmm. the signs and wonders, people were believing, people were receiving the word and they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord. And so I think, you know, uh, God was just backing up their consistency, backing up their story. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then I just kind of keyed in on this other thing, but unbelieving Jews yeah. stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. And I thought, man, does that not happen today yeah. <laughs> in some kind of fierce way? Right. And that we, sh- we need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our minds against some some teachers, some speakers, some people that are just super divisive, super uh, poisoning people's minds, you know, yeah. against the brothers. And um, it's it's a fine line, right? Like we need right. to we need to address people. We need to keep people accountable. But at the same time, there's relationship and there's accountability that needs to happen in a healthy way. Anyway, so those are some of the things that kind of stuck out to me. What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And there are people in there. There's wolves and cheese clothing in our in our world that are trying to stir up dissension. They don't want us to hear the gospel. You know, yeah. they don't want people believing. They want people at, at odds and not paying attention. You yeah. Know? I think that it's, it's so healthy to remember that, you know, Ephesians gives us a real like, look, like, Hey, this, uh, there's spiritual battle, you know, like so much. So you need to put on the armor of God, you know, like uh, this is serious business. Like, it's not a game um, The the enemy goes about see, seeking whom he may yep. devour. He goes to steal, to kill and to destroy. Like he's not playing kitty games, you know? And so I think uh, it's just good. I mean, shoot, like they're, they're getting ready to like stone people, like mm-hmm. put them to death, you know, uh, for the sharing of the gospel. Uh, but I love how it, it ends in verse seven there, there they can, they continued preaching the gospel unstoppable (laughs) yeah like lord let us have faith like paul and barnabas that even in the face of that kind of resistance that we would not be shaken that we would not draw back all right we'll continue on in verse eight there it says in lystra a man was sitting who was without strength in his feet and had never walked and had been lame from birth he listened as paul spoke and after looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And he jumped up and he began to walk around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, saying in the Lycaonian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas, they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was outside the town, brought bowls and wreaths to the gates because he intended with the crowds to offer sacrifice. The apostles Barnabas and Paul tore their robes when they heard this and rushed into the crowd shouting, people! Why are you doing these things? We are people also just like you, and we are proclaiming good news to you that you turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. In past generations, he allowed the nations to go their own way, although he did not leave himself without a witness since he did what is good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food and your hearts with joy. Even though they said these things, they barely stopped the crowds from sacrificing to them. And so I think let's pause right there because that was a lot. Um, yeah. Go Jump on in there and show, tell me what you got. Um, One of the things is, and that I've seen in there is God's common grace to make a witness of himself, you know, by sending them rain and giving them joy in their hearts. And, you know, there was a time where he allowed, like I said, all nations to go their own way. You know, they were without God and without hope in the world. And yet he still gave him enough to reveal himself to them and his, and his goodness. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of Christian homes are in the, 
in the habit of saying grace right before you eat. Yeah. And, and I think that sometimes you lose the meaning of it, right? Just in the, the mundaneness maybe of, of the act, like you don't think about what you're actually doing, but I think, I think what you're pointing out, what the scriptures are saying here is pretty powerful that, that, rain from heaven, producing fruitful seasons, producing food to fill our bellies and our hearts to be filled with joy are not just random, you know, enjoyable things about life. They're meant to point our hearts and our minds to Jesus, to, to celebrate the God who created the earth, the heaven, the seas and everything in them. Right. And I, I love, I love how just feeling totally on the same page with you tonight. Like as far as like what's jumping out and like what it means, it's like, man, come on. And, and I feel challenged myself tonight to be thinking about the common grace. I I, I think that was a very appropriate way to phrase it. The, uh, the common grace that exists in our lives that we don't miss it and we don't treat right. it as common, I guess would be that we treat it like the grace that it is and that we're thankful for it and we appreciate it so that it can have the impact on our hearts that God intends it to have. Gratitude towards the good things he's provided us with. And, you know, it's amazing. Like you said, you talked about like, like grace, you know, we just kind of can take it for granted and we don't like always appreciate all these blessings we have. The fact that we got food in our stomachs, the fact we got uh, just, work the things we got the little things we take for granted that are that are given to us like all the time we sometimes think are owed to us or or it's just the way things should be but it's really just a another just a revelation of god's goodness and grace to undeserving sinners because i think once again like if we had a full appreciation for what our true condition is we would be enjoying these things like even far more than we than we than we do and even through like times you're going through dry seasons hard seasons it's always good to like take the time to reflect on these things and get an attitude of joy you know for all the blessings that he actually does uh provide for us that we kind of sometimes just take for granted you know what i mean 100 percent, 100 percent, yeah and then uh, i think coupling that with kind of the concept that's kind of floating around up here is as uh, God does this incredible thing through Paul and Barnabas, the reaction from the people is to like, uh, you know, crown them as gods and bring them gifts and offer them sacrifices. And they're like, whoa, whoa, time out. You know, like, no, you do not understand. We are just normal like average Joe folk up here, you know, like we're not anything special. God is the one that's special. Right. And, and I just think that, um, man, that's, that's a powerful lesson for anybody operating in any kind of Christian ministry to remember that like God can do amazing things. And I'm not even saying it has to be as amazing as somebody who's never walked before in their whole life, though, obviously that generates a pretty high level of amazement and honor and all that stuff. But even on seemingly smaller levels, um, people can really get a little out of control with wanting to heap honor and appreciation. And they, I mean, I think generally speaking, people always just mean the best, right? I mean, these guys are taking it to a whole nother level and calling them straight up gods. So like, that's a whole nother level. A little obsessive, a little overboard. But um and so they're doing a twofold thing. One, they're, they they want to be humble themselves and and direct the praise and glory to God and not themselves. But even even more so, they don't want they don't want Zeus and Hermes getting credit mm-hmm. for the things that God, the God of heaven and earth, you know, has done. And so um, I just uh, I don't know. I was just kind of reflecting on that for a minute about mm-hmm. you know. What do we do even on the smaller scale of receiving honor and appreciation from people uh, because of the the great things that get done through you, like, like just the yeah. power of God flowing through you 
to love and care for people in times where it's like deeply impacting to them and all that kind of stuff. Like, how do we handle it? What do we do? And do we have something in place so that we don't allow ourselves to fall into the trap of pride and right. entitlement and mm -hmm. all kinds of yuck that can kind of be produced uh, from that kind of a situation. So um, awesome. And then uh, let's see, we left off. Uh, we left 19. off in verse 18. So verse 19, some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and they won over the crowds. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. After the disciples gathered around him, he got up and went into the town. And the next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. I'm telling you, tenacious. these are <laughs> two of the craziest verses in the whole Bible. Uh, if, if you want to be really honest about like, are you kidding me right now? They stoned Bold. him badly enough that they legitimately walked away thinking he was dead. Now, I don't know, like when the disciples gathered around him, did God do some kind of miracle? I mean, it doesn't tell us that right. he did. Yeah. But I'm, then he just, just the thinking, next day. Yeah, I was just, I'm just thinking like, you know, it, it's one thing to just read this on the text and then to imagine what it's really like to get like stoned, you know, and we would want to be going to the hospital, you know, where's my drugs? You know, help me take care of this pain. And you know he's going to be hurting the next day for sure. Bare minimum, you know? right? Like, right, at the bare like, minimum, he's going to be hurting. And he get up and goes into the next town. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, what? Exactly. I don't even know how to explain these two verses. Uh, like... Like, Paul, you're you are like too legit to quit, as my friend MC Hammer would say. I mean, yeah, wow. And, and then the very next verse, after they preached the gospel in that town and had many disciples and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. I mean, um, who needs who needs uh encouragement to to remain in the faith? than the person that just mm -hmm. got his tail stoned. stoned. You know what I mean? Like that guy needs encouragement. And yet he's the one that's going and encouraging and strengthening uh, the disciples to continue in the faith and, and telling them it is necessary to go through many hardships <laughs> to enter the kingdom of God. Um, Putting I your money wonder, where your mouth is. I, I could, we, could we just submit a request for like an edit of the Bible to be like, uh, Lord, I, I think that, you know, in an, one of the ancient manuscripts, you could have like had this one accidentally get left off and just whoops, you know, yeah. like it's necessary to go through a couple of hardships, you know, like, or hardships are completely unnecessary. I mean, some of those kinds of verses would have been much mm -hmm. more appealing if you ask me, but instead it's necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Um, and so, okay. Obviously, obviously, if you see a relationship between hardships and the kingdom of God, then that makes the hardships almost attractive. Yeah, if you have an understanding of what the kingdom of God is, right? Yeah. There's a real challenge suffering. here for us. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say in suffering, you know, it builds character, you know. So if you're able to see the big picture, it makes the hardships not as hard, even though they're still very difficult. Right. Yeah, I just, it strikes me that we need to have a revelation of the kingdom of God in order to have a proper understanding or a proper perspective on hardships. Because obviously Paul had that, right? I mean, here's what I'm thinking yeah. is when he got knocked off his donkey on the way to Damascus, 
bright light, Jesus, you know, why are you persecuting me? What the heck, bro? You know, what's going on? And he's like, who are you? And who are you, Lord? So he knew he was Lord, whoever he was. And he's like, yeah. I'm Jesus, the one that you crucified, you know? And uh, and so, uh, and then who knows what Jesus was revealing to him during three days of blindness and probably a lot of silence and solitude and that kind of thing. Um, but, but obviously in that, somewhere in this journey, right, he's had an incredible revelation of the kingdom of God. So when, so when he encounters these hardships, I mean, Paul is the poster boy for encountering hardships. So I don't know. I think that's, yeah. it just feels like an impactful point tonight, you know, like that um, it's not just a grin and bear it. It's not a, just a, just grit your way through it. It's like Jesus for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Yeah. And so do we have a clear enough view of the kingdom of God that we have the joy in front of us enough to endure the cross, whatever that cross of suffering yeah. is for us. Right. And I think it looks different yeah. a lot of times from person to person, but it's always dying to self, which is painful. No matter, oh, man, the yes, no, no, no matter the delivery method. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I don't know this. I'm kind of being like, just freshly struck by this concept tonight, uh, like uh, live yeah. and in person, right here. You know, I do. I do think you touching on Paul's um, experience. You know, being blind for three days and and having that. You know, he saw the risen Lord, and I, I'm sure that gave him a certain kind of uh, boldness and faith that you know we don't have it. We don't see him yet. We believe in him. You know, and we didn't really have have that experience, and not not to like dismiss it, but I'm sure that added to his like boldness and encouragement that he actually saw the Lord himself and was blind, which I think would help encourage him and to go through the suffering. You know, a thousand a thousand percent. I agree. I was actually just listening to a podcast today, and the guy that was talking, he was like don't pray for God to give you more peace. Don't pray for God to give you more patience, more money, more whatever, you know, like whatever the thing is that you're asking God for. He's like, just ask him for more of him, you know, like just ask him for him. Like seek, you know, it's the, the cliche thing, seek his face and not his hand because if you seek his face you get his hand too right his hand is thrown in because mm -hmm. he wants to he he's so good he wants to bless and and strengthen and encourage and all the things and um and and i think that i i feel like we're hitting on that same topic by what you were saying like it was a revelation of god it was a revelation uh, of yes. jesus himself right the resurrected christ was the thing that strengthened him to be able to endure being stoned and then getting up out of the rock pile and continuing on to go and make more disciples. Like, wow, I just blows my mind. I and mean, maybe was, God. And he's, oh, I was just going to say, he was just a uh, filled with love too, man. He would rather himself, you know, go to hell himself and to save his brethren, you know, I mean, if that's not like a uh, passion, uh, you know, for loving God and loving people, I don't, I don't know what is man. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's jump back into verse 23. When they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia, came to Pamphylia. After they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Adaliah. From there, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. And after they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. 
and they spent a considerable time with the disciples. Man, you can really see God's hand and all the fruit that he's producing in, in spite of all this suffering and how the gospel's still getting spread. And you yeah. can see God's hand in it all, making sure the good news is preached, man. Like, in spite of all the adverse stuff that came against him, you know, and, and the Christians at that time, the gospel just continued to grow in spite of the suffering. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking here, um, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, um, I remember talking to a guy one time that I had actually gone to Bible college with, and he was telling me, um, he was telling me about how, uh, he, you know, he was trying to do, he was trying to do life and do church like Paul did. Um, so he wasn't, he wasn't really a part of a church, you know, he was, and, and I walked away from that encounter and I thought to myself, I think you're talking about one of the most prolific church planters in world history. Um, and, and yet using it as a reason to not be committed to the local church. Wow. So then it got me, it got me thinking a little bit like, so, you know, when they had appointed elders, so there's a, a case for, you know, elders being the, the governing kind of body for the church. And I, that is definitely a conversation for another episode or, you know, whatever, like that's a lot to try to dig into. Um, and then he goes and mentions, mentions all these cities, Pisidia, Pamphylia, and Perga, Adalia, and, um, and then you, you, you know, you see these church names later, you know, mentioned periodically throughout different texts and stuff. And, um, and so the thought that it led me to, I'm not being very like poetic here, but like, um, it, it seems like the current, uh, thought process in church is like, you know, you get people together and then there's money, obviously that kind of there's resources available, right? Cause all these people are joined together. Uh, in one accord and um and hondas are really affordable i'm just kidding um it's, it's one accord but uh so they're all gathered together and there's resources available and a lot of times you know we want to invest these resources into community outreach and stuff like that sometimes or a lot of times i would almost say um the the community outreach has no has no gospel like message behind it and so it just got me thinking like maybe and i don't claim to have everything all figured out so i'm just kind of throwing it out there like you know like let's just mm -hmm. throw it against the wall and see if it sticks kind of a thing like um maybe we're supposed to be first and foremost primarily about preaching the gospel and that doesn't mean i don't think we should ever like we should never meet needs mm -hmm. But it seems like the most important thing they were doing yeah. was preaching the gospel. Yeah. Was was preaching the resurrected Christ. And then I think to myself, well, then as people are encountering the power of God, sometimes their needs are met by miraculous intervention mm -hmm. because signs and wonders were following them that believed as they preached the gospel. But then as they get saved, as they become a part of the family of God, well, then the book of Acts talks about how they shared all these things in common. And there wasn't a single one of the, among them that was in need. Mm -hmm. And and I'm starting to be like, huh, maybe instead of trying to get them out of their place of need so that they might be interested in the gospel, Maybe we preach the gospel to them so that yes. they join the family of faith and they are pulled out of their hole that they're in because they're part of the family now. I don't know. I was just. No, I, I think that's 100 percent, 100 percent true, because, I mean, you can get a lot of people coming into a building meeting together and and have a good time and the gospel not being preached and people are it's, it can go on on their their same old merry way and maybe we made them feel good for like you know a little bit we met some of their needs or whatever but they never really heard the gospel and they never you know heard the good news never be never got saved you know 
I mean, it mm-hmm. seems like we're putting the, I don't know, like the cart, the cart before the horse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the horse yeah, needs like to the, be the gospel. gospel. Yeah. The gospel is the horse. And then all these needs that are being met, right? Like, yeah, is the cart, the cart that's pulled behind the horse uh, of the gospel message. Because if you don't, and and I know, like, I can hear the arguments in my head, even as we're talking about it. And, you know, one of the arguments would be like, well, what if they can't hear the message of the gospel over the rumbling of their tummy because they're so hungry? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, sure. In that moment, if they're starving to death, feed them some soup or something. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't feed people like Yes. But don't feed people and then, you know, hand them an invitation to come to church. Like, not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't want to sound overly critical. I just, but like preach the gospel to them right then, yeah. you know, like. Man, and, and that's what, that's what's for... going to, that's what's going to save them anyways. You know what I'm saying? Man, you can't guarantee that everybody's going to respond well. You can't, you can't guarantee anything like that. I mean, that's really kind of all in God's in God's hands. But if you preach the gospel, they're hearing the message and that's how they come to believe. But if you never share that, it's just a, you know, a fun little gathering. Yeah. And, and then I was just, I know you were there when I preached on it. I was preaching about uh, the book of Jude. And one of the things that I was so impacted by in studying for that is like Jude lived his whole life next to the perfect Jesus, you know, like Mm -hmm. grew up as his half brother, right? That's like, why can't you make your bread, your bed like Jesus? Why can't you wash the dishes like Jesus? You know, like, why can't you make a a wooden bench like Jesus? You know, like a a lot of pressure to grow up under, but, but like history says he didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah until after he rose from the dead, Yeah, that there was something about the power of the risen Jesus. Yeah. That was more powerful than a whole life of really nice living, you know, like he like Jesus lived a perfect life. And it wasn't enough to convince Jude that he was the Messiah until after. But but right. But his resurrection from the dead. Boom. Believer and not just a believer. uh, A leader. Yeah. Yeah. a leader that reproduces. I mean, holy moly, like it was a life transformative. I mean, kind of like, you know, what happened to Peter? What happened to Paul? Like, and and I think we need to look at ourselves and go, man, have I encountered the resurrected Christ? Yeah. Is my does my life reflect having an encounter with the resurrected Jesus? Feels like a good note to kind of land on tonight. As right, we, yeah. you know, we've talked about, we've talked about getting like, all kinds of hardships, you know, trials, testing, um, you know, talking about brothers, you know, seeming brothers poisoning your heart and your mind against your other brothers, and uh, a lot of different, a lot of different concepts that we talked about. But I think um, that preaching of the gospel, the power of the resurrected Jesus. And knowing the resurrected Jesus to actually equip you to in to handle hardships, which I think this this episode actually pairs really well with the interview that we had with Lisa, um, just about those hardships. And um, so go back, go back about two episodes and go check out that interview, and go get her book on Amazon. The link is in the show notes of the previous episode. So um, definitely worth your time to check out that book, Unbroken Hope by lisa white um and uh yeah just i guess one one final little shout out industrial coffee company we appreciate you guys industrial coffee company.com uh go to their website put in the promo code bible bros for 10 percent off your order and uh give them uh just thank them for supporting the podcast by giving them an order for some great coffee a coffee cup whatever anything you want to order off their website it's great stuff and uh just shout out to Levi, a uh, great guy, and we appreciate you believing in us. And um, so with that, um, man, go check out our podcast on all of the all the different podcast uh, platforms. We're on iHeartRadio and TuneIn and 
Apple and Amazon and Spotify, like we're all over the place. So go check it out, um, subscribe and like and share and all the things to help get the word out. We appreciate it more than you Very know, because uh, we, we love doing this, but we love it even more when more people get to hear about it because we believe that the message of the resurrected Christ changes lives and we want people's lives to be changed. And so with that, Matt, thanks for all your great insights tonight. Uh, Thank that you, was a man. lot of fun. Great talk. And we will we will catch you guys on the next episode. Until then, God bless you and right. have See you soon, the man. most amazing night. <laughs>